Hello everyone, welcome back to class. We're continuing on in module two today by taking a look at two other ethical theories that underlie bioethics, the practice of medicine, clinical practice today. Last time we looked at uh, liberal individualism and communitarianism or community-based ethics. Today we're going to look at two theories that are becoming more popular nowadays, which are known as the ethics of care and casuistry. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. I'll start off by talking first about the ethics of care. The ethics of care, or relationship-based ethics, is a view that was popularized in the 20th century by some notable feminist philosophers like Carol Gilligan, Nell Noddings, and Virginia Held. What's interesting about this ethical theory is that for one of the first times in moral philosophy, gendered and sexed experience is taken to be an important feature not only in how philosophy has been historically done, but what kinds of experiences and perspectives we should pay attention to if we're trying to create a well-rounded holistic ethical theory. So the ethics of care has some important notable features that I'd like to start off with telling you about. First, we can say that the ethics of care is kind of formulated in response to the modern ethical theories that have become really popular throughout the last few centuries. Things like deontology, utilitarianism, and liberal individualism. Thus, we can say that the ethics of care is kind of formulated in response to these views. Ethicists of care are going to be suspicious of applying abstract, universal rules to all ethical situations. They're going to be suspicious about being impartial, whether or not we should treat everybody the same. And the ethics of care is going to be suspicious about this idea that we should always be rational and be cold calculating machines when we're doing philosophy or engaging in moral decision making. Instead, as we'll see, the ethics of care is going to flip those ideas or priorities on their heads. It's going to value our ability to be sensitive to particular contexts. It's going to say that sometimes we should be partial and treat people differently, depending on the circumstance. And it is going to value emotion and the use of emotion in moral decision making rather than just trying to be a cold, calculating, rational machine all the time. In general, then, we could say that the ethics of care values emotion and utilizes it, rather than rejecting it. One way that we could interpret deontology, Kant's view, and utilitarianism, Mill's view, is that it tries to be a very rational, uh, calculating view of what makes an action moral or immoral. But the ethics of care is going to say there's a certain weakness in figuring out what's moral that way. Instead, there's real value in recognizing our emotions and allowing them in some sense to guide our judgments and our decision making. So it's gonna value emotion and utilize it rather than just rejecting it like Kant might. In essence, the ethics of care is all about focusing on, attending to, and meeting the needs of people and deepening our relationships with them through care and compassion. So this is an ethics that's based on relationships. It's going to recognize the primacy of relationships in our lives, and it's going to say human relationships are what make the world go round so we need to pay special attention to who we're responsible for and whether or not we're showing up, up in our relationships. That should be our primary concern when engaging in ethical judgments and decision making. Thus, we can say that the ethics of care 
is similar to communitarianism in this way because it's based on relationships and, and social structures and systems. And it may be contrasted with deontology, utilitarianism, and liberal individualism for the aforementioned reasons. One of the primary features of the ethics of care is that it is based on feminism and it is a feminist ethical theory. See, the ethicists of care, when they were pioneering this view, thought that philosophy had not really taken women's perspectives on board. They thought that when these ethical theories like deontology and utilitarianism and liberal individualism were formulated and, in, and came to saturate society, that these views didn't really take stock of privilege or the lived experiences of women. Thus, what the ethics of care is trying to do is make those experiences and perspectives of women known and start utilizing them in the formulation of philosophy. So, the ethics of care is going to base itself on these experiences not often considered or utilized in moral theory. Like some other social views, like critical theory, for example, which is a big part of progressive politics today, the ethics of care is going to utilize systemic thinking to outline social issues and provide analyses in which care is lacking. As we'll see, fundamentally the ethics of care provides a critique of both contemporary moral philosophy and contemporary Western society. It's going to say things like, currently in our society, women are doing the lion's share of the work when it comes to caring and holding relationships together. Currently our society is not based on care and compassion. And there are certain systems and structures that are oppressing and disadvantaging some groups, including women, and maybe particularly, more specifically, women of color. So, what the ethics of care is going to be providing is not just an ethical view in its own right, but also a scathing critique of capitalism and Western society in general. How it is organized, the kinds of impacts it has on people, etc. Just like communitarianism, the ethics of care critiques liberal individualism. Virginia Held characterizes that view as the view that we are all independent, rational, separate, autonomous individuals. So, liberal individualism kind of presumes that humans are separate, they get to make their own decisions, uh, we all get to kind of do what we want, our lives are up to us to determine, and if we have not succeeded socially or economically, that's because it's something that we've done, we haven't worked hard enough, or we haven't been willing to make the proper sacrifices to get ahead. The ethics of care is going to reject this view. First, it's going to say, no, it's not true that it's only the person's fault if they don't get rich or find success. Rather, there are certain social structures and systems in place that function to advantage some groups and disadvantage others. That is, we might say, according to uh, these thinkers and other critical theorists, there is some sort of structural determinism at play that plays the, a primary role in whether or not somebody achieves socioeconomic success. So it's going to say that. And it's also going to critique this view that we can look at humans in Western society as being separate, rational, distinct things. Rather, like communitarianism, it's going to argue that actually social structures, social relationships, society comes first. So the reason that any individual has the views and the values that they do 
is because they were raised in a particular culture, in a particular time, in a particular society that allowed them certain opportunities and gave them a certain kind of education. Thus, social things on this view, like in communitarianism, are going to take primacy. They exist first and have some sort of impact on the individuals that we end up being. Thus, the ethics of care is going to say, we are not independent, separate, autonomous individuals. Rather, we are social beings. We are rather interconnected and interdependent. There are a bunch of relationships that we are a part of. There are a bunch of structures and systems that are making our lives possible. Think back to when you were a child, for example. The ethicists of care are going to say, look, the reason why you are alive today is because you had parents or caregivers that were in some sort of relationship with you. If those people weren't in your life, you would have died long ago. Similarly, there are a bunch of other people living in society, keeping the lights on, working to maintain this giant system that we are a part of. Even though we don't see them, even though we might not have personal relationships with them, our lives and our success depends on them doing their thing. So, we would not be able to go to school or have a job or learn philosophy if it weren't for all of the engineers and garbage truck guys and ditch diggers and teachers and parents and grandparents and all of these people that are working together to make our life possible. So the ethics of care is going to try to shift our understanding to one that emphasizes just how radically and importantly we are connected to everybody else and how everybody working their jobs and participating in the economy and helping people out really determines whether or not we'll have the opportunities or the success that we will in life. Another aspect of the ethics of care is that they're going to say it is an ethical theory that is both self-interested and altruistic. In one chapter of the Oxford Handbook of Ethical Theory, Virginia Held says, quote, persons, persons in caring relations are acting for self and other together. So, if we are properly following in ethics of care, that involves not only doing things for other people, but also doing things for ourselves as well. Because our interests and our happiness is integrated in some indirect way with everybody else in society. So, how exactly does one follow an ethics of care? What does it mean to care for someone? What makes an action moral or immoral on this view? Well, it has everything to do with our relationships with others. The ethics of care is going to consider care as both a value and a practice, or what we might call having certain feelings about things and engaging in certain work or labor. So on this view, what it means to be a moral person is to value other people, work towards promoting their interests and meeting their needs, feeling care and compassion about them, and trying to make their life better in whatever ways we can, in whatever ways we are responsible for at the end of the day. So caring for someone just basically means showing up for them, caring about them, looking out for them. This is not the same as paternalism. That is, according to the ethics of care, caring for someone doesn't mean being their parent. For example, 
There are certain things that we do and don't let kids do because they don't know any better, right? For example, if your child is going to cross a busy street without looking because they're running after a ball, you might run up to them and grab them by the hand and stop them from doing that. Or you might force them to brush their teeth at night before bed or force them to take their medicine or try to manipulate them in subtle ways in order to get them to do what's best for them. This is what's kind of involved sometimes in being a parent. But the ethicists of care are going to say, ideally, that's not how we should be treating other people. What it means to care for someone is not forcing them to do things. It's not restricting their freedom all the time. It's not thinking that you know best and imposing that upon people. What care has to do with, especially with adults, is listening to the other person, empathizing with them, looking out for them, giving them advice, etc. So, properly caring for someone doesn't mean forcing something on them. It is a little bit more nuanced than that. It respects the individual's interests and freedoms. In other words, we could say that properly caring for someone means promoting their interests and their desires. And it also means being responsive to their needs, their physical needs, psychological needs, cultural needs, and maybe spiritual needs. Thus, in the context of bioethics, the ethics of care is going to say, well, how is the patient um, being interacted with in the hospital? Are they comfortable? Are they getting food and drink at the proper times? Is somebody checking in on them? Are we asking them how they're doing? Are we asking them if there's anything that we could be doing better? These are the kinds of questions that we would ask if we were trying to follow the ethics of care in a clinical setting. What does it mean in this particular situation? What does it mean to care for this person? And how do we do that? The, the ethicists of care characterize this view as being more receptive, intuitive, rather than objective, analytic. So they're going to say, if we're trying to properly care for someone, that doesn't mean we be a cold calculating machine all the time. That doesn't mean that we just try to solve people's problems uh, immediately. This is probably a, a funny common experience that you've had, right? You may be talking with someone and you may be telling them about a problem that you've been having and what you're actually looking for is for somebody to listen to you and give you empathy but they might be just looking to solve your problem, right? But that's not what you're looking for. The ethicists of care are going to look at an example like this and say, what it means to properly care for you in that context is to be receptive to what you're saying and intuit what you want and need, not look at the situation just objectively like a computer and act in that way. So, Following an ethics of care is all about interpersonal relationship. It's about listening, empathy, care. If we wanted to kind of sum it up, we might say that the ethics of care focuses on cultivating and exercising attentiveness, trust, empathy, responsiveness to need, sensitivity to particular situations, and caring relations in general. What it means to be a good person on this view is to show up in our relationships and care for those to the extent that we are responsible for them. That means that we're going to have different responsibilities to the different people in our lives. If you are a parent, you have a larger responsibility to take care of your kids 
before the stranger on, your, on the street. If you are a brother or sister, you have a greater responsibility to check in with your sibling rather than your cousin who lives 3,000 miles away that you never see. So because the relationships in our lives mean different things to us, because we stand in, in different relationships with people, the nature of our relationships is going to influence who we check in with, how often we do that, and the degree to which we do that. To provide a definition, I'll say this. We can define the ethics of care as the view that the morality of an action is determined by the degree to which that action cares for others and deepens our relationships with them. We can also talk about, briefly, just what the ethics of care has to say about the nature of Western society. Like a lot of other critical theories, critical gender theory, critical race theory, progressive politics in general, the ethics of care is going to criticize capitalism and criticize how we currently do things in Western societies. It's going to say that currently social relations are not based on an ethics of care. Rather, it seems like the majority of relations in our society are contractual. I do something for you if you do something for me. Or I scratch my, uh, your back, you scratch mine. This is generally how relations tend to go in Western society today. We don't care for the checkout person who's helping us with our groceries. We just want them to get the job done so we can go home. We generally don't care about the person who fills up our gas. We just want them to do a service for us. And the ethics of care is going to say, this is unfortunate. Care and compassion are not prioritized in our society. And that's not a good thing. Our relationships should be deeper with people. We should actively try to love and care for others, even those that we are not close with right now. The ethics of care would say we do have some sort of moral obligation to society in general and other social groups. In this way, it's similar to communitarianism. It's going to take the emphasis off of respecting individual rights and rationality, and instead it's going to place it on social concerns, social justice, and relationships. What the ethics of care is trying to get us to do is to uh, cultivate flourishing relationships. It would like to see society transformed from one that prioritizes economic concerns and uh, money, wealth, property, to actually caring for and valuing people. And the ethics of care is going to say that if we want the world to become a better place, if we want to establish social justice, we need to take on different priorities. We need to care less about making money, producing goods, what can you do for me? Instead, we need to start valuing education more, human relationships, poverty, inequality, etc. Thus, instituting an ethics of care in our society today would drastically require changing society's priorities and institutions. In general, then, we can say that the ethics of care is similar to communitarianism in that it cares about social concerns, social systems, social structures, and 
Like communitarianism, it's going to say that relationships make the world go round and are incredibly important. In that way, it's going to differ from some of the other views that we've looked at so far, like deontology, utilitarianism, and rights-based theory that focus on being objective and analytic and impartial, rational, and calculating. Rather, the ethics of care is going to try to be more context-dependent, sensitive to particular situations, because we're dealing with specific, unique individuals that have differing needs and differing goals and desires. Of course, like the other ethical theories that we've looked at, the ethics of care also has some problems and weaknesses. Again, none of these views are perfect. For starters, since this is a view that has come out within the 20th century, it is still a little bit underdeveloped. So, some philosophers are going to argue that this view is not complete, it's not comprehensive, and in that sense it lacks some utility. What the ethics of care provides for us is kind of a general sketch or framework. Thus, it's not going to be incredibly useful when it comes to making a judgment or a decision in particular cases. It's not always easy to figure out what proper care looks like and how to carry it out. For example, let's say your friend is suffering from depression, a debilitating depression. When they take their medication, they're doing well, but when they don't take it, they kind of fall into a hole and they don't take care of themselves and they let their house get dirty and messy and stinky. What does proper care look like in this situation? Let's say you want to help your friend out, you want to care for them. Does that mean force feeding them their medication? Does that mean just encouraging them to take their medication while you know that they're not going to take it just because you encourage them to? Does that mean just not saying anything? and letting them get more depressed? It's not always easy to figure out what proper care looks like. Or take another example. Let's say your brother is starting to drink a lot and you recognize that his drinking is bad for his health, it's bad for his relationships, and he's starting to struggle in school. How do you properly care for your brother in this scenario? Does proper care look like just sitting him down and having a talk with him, that may not solve the problem. You know, he might just keep drinking or he may start drinking and keeping it hidden. Does it look like taking his bottle away from him? Is that what we should do for somebody who is starting to drink a lot? Should we take away their money or take away their, their access to booze? It's not obvious what proper care looks like. So that's one of the weaknesses that the ethics of care faces. Because it provides for us a general sketch, because it is an underdeveloped theory and it's fairly new, it's not complete and it lacks specific guidance in a lot of situations. In some cases, it would seem actually that being impartial and having an ethical theory based on rational principles is important and necessary. The ethics of care can fall into some issues because it is very context dependent and it is a view that is relative to the particular situation at hand. But sometimes we want to be able to say definitively that something is objectively right or wrong. If that's what we're looking for, we might want to lean on some of the other more objective, universal ethical views like deontology and utilitarianism to justify our arguments or justify certain treatments and procedures. Finally, the last weakness that the authors discuss is that 
while the ethics of care is a feminist philosophy, it's not clear that following it is actually going to help women escape oppression. Here's what the authors basically have in mind. Currently, society does not distribute care equally. Generally, women uh, take up the lion's share of caring for their aging parents or their spouses or their children. If this is the way things are right now, if caring professions and caring obligations are falling primarily on women, telling women that following an ethics of care is good isn't really going to help them escape their situation. It's not going to help us reform society so that care is redistributed more equally and justly. In sum, then, the ethics of care is a feminist view that while it does have some issues and some weaknesses, it does provide us with certain strengths and different perspectives of looking at what clinical practices may be moral or immoral. If we look at it through the lens of, are these practices going to care for the individual or not? Okay, so that is the ethics of care. I'd like now to just look at one other view, and that is going to be casuistry, which is an ethical theory that has become a little bit more popular within the last few decades. Casuistry, or case-based reasoning, is an ethical theory that is very sensitive to particular cases, contexts, and situations. Like the ethics of care and communitarianism, casuistry is suspicious of some of the features and presuppositions of the other ethical theories. It's going to be suspicious of basing ethics completely on rules, rights, and universal abstract principles. It's dissatisfied with the problems and weaknesses of traditional ethical theories like deontology, utilitarianism, and rights-based theory. Instead, Casuistry is going to argue that ethical decisions should be made based on particular contexts, history, and precedent. So, what it's going to be focusing on is how have situations like the one we're facing right now been handled in the past? What kind of legal and medical precedent do we have here? Is this case analogous to cases that have shown up in this hospital before? How did the doctors handle that case? So casuistry is going to be looking at previous cases for some sort of guidance on what to do in a particular situation. And it's going to say these abstract universal rules they're not going to work across every situation, so we need to look at the particular features of this case in order to figure out what to do. Thus, the authors say, casuistry encourages, quote, acting in light of any strong social consensus found in precedent cases in medicine and law. Instead of basing moral judgments and decision making on these abstract principles like the greatest happiness principle or the first formulation of the categorical imperative. What casuistry is going to say is that decision making should be based on uh, rules that are grounded in experience and tradition. We should look at how cases were handled in the past, what the thought process was, in order to make determinations on cases that we face in clinical settings today.
this is an ethical theory too that has been making something of a recent comeback historically due to its relativity uh, and its highly context uh, specific nature casuistry has been likened to sophistry and empty rationalizations basically thinkers in the past didn't look too kindly on casuistry because they thought that those who engaged in it were not principled uh, they weren't basing their ideas on objectively rational and good arguments but instead were just looking at everything relatively looking at everything in particular in recent medical ethics though there's been something of a, a move towards using casuistry and applying some of its ideas to the very strange cases that end up popping up in medicine so people are starting to rely on it a little bit more and uh, seeing that it does have some use that it has use as a, a framework that we can use when we're trying to make some sort of decision for a patient or on behalf of a patient one of the reasons why it has become more popular recently is because a lot of thinkers nowadays are coming to believe that morality and ethics is not a science it's not objective and universal black and white rather it's a big huge gray area that needs to be navigated with nuance and sensitivity to particular situations so it's not the same thing as like physics or chemistry rather what a lot of doctors and care teams have to deal with in medical contexts are strange difficult gray cases Casuistry is going to argue that a lot of the forms of moral reasoning and judgment that we use now aren't based on principles, rules, rights, or virtues. Instead, a lot of the moral reasoning that we use in medical contexts are based on narratives, analogies, models, and intuition see the problem with using an ethical theory like deontology or utilitarianism that is based on these principles is that oftentimes principles conflict we recognize for example in a in a case that doing X Y or Z does respect the individuals political rights but at the same time doing X Y or Z might not actually be what's good for them on a utilitarian analysis or we might recognize that according to deontology doctors have some sort of ethical duty to be honest with their patients but you can imagine a scenario in which the doctor keeping some sort of information hidden might be better for the patient in terms of generating a positive health outcome if they know for example that a patient hearing some sort of information will cause them to be pessimistic will which will decrease their likelihood of survival so the problem with these ethical views or these ethical theories is that oftentimes in the cases that we look at principles and rules can conflict and these principles and rules may conflict with protecting human rights what are we supposed to do in situations like that which principle should be our top priority which right should we try to protect over and above the others well it's not obvious so casuistry is going to say principles duties and rights often conflict instead of worrying about them let's just look at the case in and of itself and if there are any historical historically analogous cases 
that will give us a good guide as to what we're supposed to do in this particular situation. Thus, casuists are going to say that impasses like these can be avoided by focusing on shared agreement about how to think about situations, what to do, etc. And some of them may even argue that our moral beliefs, knowledge, and theories come from real experience with particular cases in the first place. A lot of ethical theorists tend to presuppose that the principles come first and then we apply those principles to cases to figure out what to do. But the casuists are going to provide a different genealogy for our morals. That is a different story about how we come to have the principles and ideas that we do. They're going to say in the real world all we're dealing with are particular cases. Ever since the the time that we're born and we began to live through life, we're having particular real-world experiences. We're dealing with unique situations. And then, over time, as we get older and we start to reflect on those particular experiences, then we start to come to believe in principles. We abstract principles and rules from these particular experiences. So principles arise after, not prior to cases. Because this is the way that we come to have our moral education and our own beliefs and knowledge as to what is right, the casuists are going to say it only makes sense to apply the same kind of method to medical cases in clinical settings. Instead of presuming that there are some objective principles or rules that exist prior to cases and then apply them to cases, we should take the cases as being prior and then see what we should do in relation to that particular case. What this grants casuistry is a lot of flexibility. It gives us a good excuse to examine past cases and what these cases might recommend, how they might guide us. And it is highly sensitive to the unique and particular nature of cases as they show up in medical contexts. The problem, however, is that this flexibility kind of cuts both ways. Casuistry, like the ethics of care, like deontology, utilitarianism, so on and so forth, it also has weaknesses and problems. For starters, casuists often disagree on what should be done in a particular case. While it's true that duties, principles, and rights according to these different ethical views, conflict, analogies and intuitions often conflict too. And you know this just based on talking to people in clinical settings. What will be intuitive to the nurse to do for a particular patient may not line up with what's intuitive uh, to the doctor. What's intuitive uh, to the care team might not line up with what's intuitive to the ethics committee. So not all cases are equal. In fact, we should probably say no two cases are completely alike. The analogies and the histories that we use to guide us in particular cases are going to be different and they may conflict. So we're kind of left throwing up our hands in the air as to what we're supposed to do in a particular case given that no two cases are completely alike. Similarly, some thinkers argue that casuistry quote, presupposes rather than defeats the claim that principles are essential to moral reasoning and judgment. That line of thinking kind of goes as follows. Whenever we encounter a case in a medical context, 
it needs to be interpreted. Whether we realize it or not, we bring various models and rules to bear on a case in order to interpret it. So when we're looking at a case such as a daughter you know, needs a kidney and the dad is a good match for her, but the dad doesn't want to donate his kidney, when we're interpreting that case, we are already bringing to bear on, our, on this analysis our moral presuppositions, our ideas, and our beliefs. We're picking out the relevant information, what we think is important to making an ethical determination here. So even though it might be true that we do come to believe in moral principles over time, and that these moral principles are based on the particular experiences that we have, engaging in a case-by-case -case analysis requires us to invoke principles. It requires us to invoke certain rules about what we think is right or wrong. It requires us to presuppose that there is an objective answer to the question, what should we do in this situation? Insofar as engaging in ethical analysis and moral decision making presupposes and requires all that stuff, we might say that casuistry doesn't really have uh, a one up on the other ethical theories. Finally, and this is perhaps the biggest, most important objection to casuistry. It's not obvious that case judgments should take priority in decision making within clinical settings. Casuistry is going to look to the past in order to help guide cases in the present. It's going to say, okay, there was a similar case like this that appeared in 1994 at this hospital. What did the doctors do then? What course of action did they take? Oh, okay, now we're dealing with a different case. It looks like a case similar to this popped up in 2004. What happened then? But when we're looking at cases, why should we prioritize simply what people in healthcare settings have done in the past? After all, they could have been wrong in their decisions, right? Maybe they didn't take into account all of the necessary information. Maybe they made the wrong decision, or they engaged in moral reasoning badly. Simply looking at how cases were handled in the past does not tell us whether or not those cases were handled appropriately. We need to do some more moral reasoning and some more reflection if we're going to figure that out. So, it's not obvious we should just rely on case judgments in figuring out what we do in the here and now. Instead, it seems like we need to presuppose or invoke objective morals, ideas, and principles in order to justify case judgments or argue against them. That is casuistry. To summarize again what we looked at today, we looked at the ethics of care, which is a feminist ethical theory based on strengthening and cultivating our relationships. And casuistry is an ethical theory that in the field of bioethics is context dependent, looks to previous case judgments in order to guide case judgments today. All of the views that we've been looking at, I want you to interpret as possible frameworks to bring to bear on the cases that you're going to face in hospitals, in the medical field, wherever it may be. My goal in these lectures is not to argue that one of these is better than the others. It's not to try to convince you that one of these is the correct one and all the other ones are false. Instead, what I'm trying to do is give you a bunch of different perspectives or frameworks that you can use to make arguments and engage in moral decision making. Thus, see all of the frameworks that we've been looking at so far as tools 
That's how they should be interpreted. Okay, that completes what I wanted to get through in today's lecture. I hope you all found the information interesting, and I'm looking forward to see what you all have to say about it. I will see you next time. Have a good one.